In all this talk of collisions, whether they be elastic or inelastic, let's remember one very important idea. And that is that in a closed system in which no mass or energy enters or leaves, momentum is conserved. We can justify this statement by looking at the action-reaction pair of forces between colliding objects. When object one collides with object two, one exerts a force on two, and the reaction to that is two exerts a force on one. Forces are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. And the time of the collision is the same for both objects. So therefore, looking at the impulse momentum theorem, if both objects experience the same force for the same amount of time, they'll both experience the same change in momentum. The change in momentum of the first object will be equal but opposite in direction to the change in momentum of the second object. So the net change then is zero. And that's what we say here. Momentum is conserved. That means the net change in momentum is zero. Now let's look at elastic collisions in one dimension. Remember that elastic collision is one in which kinetic energy is conserved. So that means the initial kinetic energy before the collision is the same as the final kinetic energy after the collision. And here is the equation that would allow us to figure out those values. Remember, momentum is conserved in all collisions. Here we're going to analyze an elastic collision between a moving ball and a stationary ball. We'll call the incoming ball the projectile, and we'll call the stationary ball the target. So the target is going to be struck by the projectile. And if we look at our equations over here for conservation of kinetic energy and conservation of momentum, they look quite long. But if we have a stationary target, then the equation simplifies somewhat because V2 initial is zero. So you see on the left hand side of the equations, the terms that had V2 initial in them disappear because V2 initial has a value of zero meters per second. Because it's an elastic collision, kinetic energy is going to be conserved and all collisions, momentum is conserved. So here's our equation that shows our conservation of momentum and here is our equation that shows our conservation of kinetic energy. So let's assume in our elastic collision, we know the masses of our two objects and we know the initial velocity of the incoming projectile. Let's calculate what the final velocities of the balls will be. So we'll start off with our conservation of kinetic energy because we know it's an elastic collision. And so all of the kinetic energy is initially with the first object, the projectile. Then one half M1 V1 final squared is the final kinetic energy of the ball number one, and one half M2 V2 final squared is the kinetic energy of ball number two. I will go ahead and move this term to the other side. You notice every term has a one half, so that can drop out of the equation. If I factor out the M1 on the left side, I end up with the difference of perfect squares, V1 initial squared minus V1 final squared, and we know we can rewrite the difference of perfect squares like this. And the reason for that, you'll see in a minute, is to simplify the algebra. Okay, I'll stop there for now for uh, elastic collision conservation of kinetic energy, and we'll move over to our equation for conservation of momentum. The momentum is entirely with the first ball, the projectile, before the collision, and then the momentum is now divided among the two uh, objects. Uh, object one and object two, each with momentum m times v, using their final velocities, of course. I'll move this term to the other side and factor out the m1. And now I take these two equations, and I'm going to divide one of them by the other. So I've rewritten equation on the left here, and I've rewritten the equation on the right here, and I'm dividing one by the other. On the left side, you see all these, the first and second terms cancel out. And on the right side, this, this square cancels off with V2 final, and the M2s cancel out. And I'm left with this statement here that says the initial velocity of the projectile plus the final velocity of the projectile is equal to the final velocity of the target.
we're going to use that equation and plug it into our conservation of momentum equation. But first, we're going to plug in for V2F, V1 initial plus V1 final. So right there, I'm going to replace that. And then I'm going to solve this equation for V1F. You can follow the algebra here to get my solution for V1F. Then I'm going to take this equation up here and solve it for V1 final and substitute what I get in for V1 final right here in the equation for conservation of momentum. And that looks like this now. And now I'm going to solve this equation for V2 final. You can follow the algebra. And now I have an expression for the final velocity of object one and the final velocity of object two. So the first example we'll look at is an elastic collision of two objects with equal mass. So if we look at the equations we just derived for the final velocities of the first and second objects for the projectile and the target, we see that for the first equation that gives us the final velocity of the projectile, if, equal, if the masses are equal, this fraction here becomes zero because m1 minus m2 will be zero with equal mass. So that tells us that the final velocity of the projectile is zero. In other words, after the collision, it completely stops. And the second uh, object, the target, it's going to leave according to this equation. And if the masses are equal, 2m is the same as m1 plus m2, so that equals 1. So the final velocity then is 1 times the initial velocity of the first object. So in other words, all the velocity that was with the first one now is with the second one. The first one stops, and the second one continues on with the same velocity that the first one had. Let's see this in a real-life example. Now let's look at the example of a very massive target. In other words, M2 is very large. So when we look at this fraction here, if M2 is very large, that means this fraction is approximately negative 1. So what that means is the final velocity of the projectile will be about the same as it was coming in, but in the opposite direction. In other words, it will bounce off and rebound backwards at about the same speed that it came in at. And the target is very large, so we wouldn't expect it to move very much at all. And sure enough, when you plug in a very large number for M2 here, this is basically zero, very close to zero. So the, the target doesn't move very much, as we would expect. Let's look at a real-world example for this one. Lastly, let's look at a very massive projectile. In other words, very large mass number one. When we have a very large M1, we notice that this ratio here uh, is about one. So that means for a very massive projectile encountering a very small target, as we would expect, hitting the target doesn't affect its velocity very much. So the projectile's final velocity is about the same as its initial velocity. However, for the target object, when we look at this ratio with a very large M1, this ratio is about 2. So in other words, the projectile gets launched from the collision at a speed that is about twice that of the incoming projectile. I don't have an example to show you of a massive projectile hitting a very small target but I do have a similar uh, situation to share with you. Uh, this is problem number 69 from the textbook. We're going to drop a baseball and a basketball, and the basketball will bounce off the floor and be moving upward when it strikes the baseball that's still moving downward, and that will project the baseball up into the air. The basketball's mass is given to us as 630 grams. We're going to drop the balls from a height of 1.8 meters and assume that their different radii don't affect the height that they fall. We'll just say they both fall 
1.8 meters. And we're going to assume that the basketball bounces elastically off the floor, which means it will leave the floor at the same speed that it struck the floor. And we'll also assume that the baseball and the basketball collide elastically as well. What value of the baseball's mass will cause the basketball to completely stop after the collision with the baseball? And after that happens, how high does the baseball go? Here's the information that is given to me. 630 gram basketball dropped from a height of 1.8 meters. I'm going to use equations of motion to figure out how fast will the ball be moving when it hits the floor. The basketball will be moving 5.94 meters per second, and it will also bounce up because of the elastic collision at the same speed. So here's a diagram of what's going on just before the collision. Both balls are moving with a speed of 5.94 meters per second, and they're moving towards each other. During the collision of the basketball and the baseball, since it's an elastic collision, kinetic energy is conserved and momentum is conserved. So looking at our conservation of kinetic energy, one-half mv squared for the basketball plus one-half mv squared for the baseball, where I don't know the mass of the baseball, that's the kinetic energy before the collision equals the kinetic energy after the collision. But since it's a requirement that the basketball stop, it's going to have zero kinetic energy. So all the kinetic energy will be with the baseball. And we see in this equation we have two unknowns, the mass of the baseball here and there, and the final velocity of the baseball. So I need a second equation, two equations and two unknowns. So I'm going to use my conservation of momentum as my second equation. Big M times big V is the mass and velocity of the basketball. Little m and little v is the mass and velocity of the baseball. And after the collision, only the baseball is moving, so only it has momentum. And I have the same two unknowns. So I'm going to solve this equation for Vf, make the substitution into my kinetic energy equation here. Now I have an equation that only has the unknown m in it, and I'm going to solve the equation for m. And I see that I need a 210-gram baseball to participate in this collision so that the basketball stops after the collision. Now let's see how high the baseball is going to go. Since it's an elastic collision, the kinetic energy will be conserved. How much kinetic energy is there? Well, before the collision, I have the kinetic energy of the basketball and of the baseball. So they're both moving at 5.94 meters per second. I know now that the baseball's mass is 210 grams. The basketball's mass is 630 grams. So doing this calculation, I find that I have 14.83 joules of energy in my system in the form of kinetic energy. After the collision, all of that energy will be with the baseball alone. Because it's an elastic collision, the baseball will have the same amount of kinetic energy. And I'm going to solve that for V. I see that gives me 11.94 meters per second. And an object traveling straight up at that speed using equations of motion, I find will go to a height of 7.2 meters. That's over 25 feet. That's really high. Just from dropping a basketball with the baseball uh, from about shoulder level. Does it really go that high? Don't forget we assumed that the collision was elastic. So does it really go this high? And the answer is not quite. Because we know the collision is not elastic, it's really an inelastic collision, some kinetic energy is lost. But by assuming it's elastic, we can find out what's the maximum height that it could go to, and it gives us a rough idea of how high it could go. Our basketball, our baseball. Check out how high these different balls bounce. The basketball, the super bouncy ball, and the golf ball. Now I'm gonna try the golf ball on top of the bouncy ball on top of the basketball. <laughs> 
Did you see that? Probably not. So here it is again. The golf ball bounced to 28 feet. We dropped it from about three and a half feet, so it went up 800% of its dropped height. In fact, if you consider that by itself, the golf ball bounces about 70% of its dropped height, it went as high as if it had fallen from 40 feet up. That is awesome. So how can we get the golf ball to bounce up with that much energy? Let's simplify it to these two balls. When you drop them individually, each ball starts out with some potential energy from the height of the drop. As the balls hit the ground, some energy goes into heating up the ground and some goes into heating the ball. Because that energy left the ball system, you can't get back up to the same height. But when you combine them, the tennis ball goes higher than its dropped height. Way higher. Where does it get the extra energy? As the basketball bounces, it compresses, storing elastic potential energy. As it releases, it springboards the tennis ball upward just at the right moment. This is like the double bounce on a trampoline when you jump right before someone else. You prepare the elastic of the trampoline by stretching it and storing energy, which can then bounce the jumper even higher. In the same way, the basketball stores energy in its compression and is able to push the tennis ball. But just like the double bounce preparer, the basketball can't go as high. You can see that here. It bounces even less when three balls are dropped together. Also, during that transfer of energy, some momentum transfers from the basketball to the tennis ball. And since the basketball starts with way more more momentum because of its larger mass, the tennis ball's velocity increases by a lot and it flies up, up, and away. Now back to the triple super ball bounce. Now you get the energy from the basketball's bounce being transferred into the bounce of the super bouncy ball, which is then transferred to the golf ball's bounce. You put the same amount of energy or momentum from two more massive objects into a smaller object and it will go much faster. Epic! Oh! Oh!